Now, are we ready to go into some fun? I'm going to take several minutes to show you all the places where the Quran states Muhammad was a sinner, a vile, immoral sinner, whose God threatened to kill and damn to hell if he didn't tell the line. Are you ready? And this comes from this article that I already gave you the link to. But I'll give it to you again. The name of the article, Evidence That Muhammad Was a Sinful Transgressor. Are you ready? You got it there? Okay, let's begin. Now, first class, you don't need to quote. I'm just going to be quoting the verses. Chapter 4, verse 106 to 107. Surah Al-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 106 to 107. And ask forgiveness of Allah. Ask forgiveness of Allah. Surely Allah is forgiving, merciful, and do not plead on behalf of those who act unfaithfully. So Allah is telling his servant, his prophet, ask forgiveness of me and don't plead, don't ask me to forgive the unfaithful, those who act unfaithfully to their souls. Surely Allah does not love him who is treasured treacherous. Chapter 9, verse 43. Chapter 9, verse 43. Allah pardon you. Allah forgive you. Starts out by saying, Allah forgive you. I thought Muhammad is perfect and sinless. Why does he need forgiving? Why did you give them leave until those who spoke the truth had become manifest to you and you had not known the liars? So Allah's rebuking him. Allah forgive you. Why did you let them go? Why did you let them go, right? Before Allah had made manifest to you the liars. Now, the Historical context of this verse is interesting, right? But anyway, we'll talk about, we'll do a session on this in the future. Chapter 40, verse 55. Chapter 40, verse 55. Then have patience, O Muhammad. Lo, the promise of Allah is true. And ask forgiveness of thy sin. And him the praise of thy Lord at fall of night and in the early hours. Hmm, again, Muhammad is supposedly perfect and sinless. Masum, Isma. Right, is repeatedly told, ask forgiveness for your sins, Muhammad. Now here, chapter 47, verse 19. Chapter 47, verse 19. So no, O Muhammad, there is no God save Allah. And ask forgiveness for thy sin and for believing men and believing women. So ask Allah to forgive you your sins and the sins of your community, believing men and believing women. Allah knoweth both your place of turmoil and your place of rest. That was 47, 19. Chapter 48, verses 1 to 2. Chapter 48, verses 1 to 2. Lo, we have given thee, O Muhammad, a signal victory. That Allah, now this one's funny. That Allah may forgive thee of thy sin which is past and that which is to come. And may perfect, perfect his favor unto thee and may guide thee on a right path. Did you catch it? Not only has Allah forgiven you your past sins, he's even going to forgive you for your future sins. Showing that even Allah knew his prophet would foul things up and end up sinning again and again, which is why Allah has to forgive him again and again. What? Did you catch it? Focus, guys. Yep. So Allah is telling him, you're going to sin in the future, and I'm going to forgive you. You're going to be sinning over and over again. I'm going to forgive you over and over again, which means two things, as Catholic noticed. This is giving him carte blanche. Go ahead, sin. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Rape captive women with my permission. Go ahead. Rape married captive women with my permission. Chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran. Go ahead. Treat women as whores. Prostitute them in the name of temporary marriage. Zawaj al -Muta. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Lust for your adopted son's wife with my permission. Because I'm going to put that lust in your heart. Causing him to divorce her so you can marry her. And then abolish adoption so that they stop calling Zayed your son. Because of the embarrassment of taking his adopted son's divorced wife. Your adopted son's divorced wife. Go ahead. Don't worry. I've forgiven you. Go ahead. I'm forgiving you. Go ahead. Recite. The satanic verses, al qaraniq where you said, have you pondered on Alat and Uzzamanat, the third, the other, the daughters of Allah? <clears throat> These are high-flying cranes whose intercession is accepted, causing all the pagans to bow down, accepting Islam because you praise their, their goddesses, and then realizing it was Satan who inspired you to utter the praise of the idols. So Gabriel had to come and correct you, so I forgive you again for that, boo-boo. Go ahead. 
So this is carte blanche saying, God, you're going to sin over and over again. And I'm going to forgive you over and over again. But secondly, secondly, this shows Muhammad had to sin. Do you know why? If Allah is all-knowing and he perfectly knows the future, that means Muhammad could not stop sinning because then he'd falsify Allah's words, proving either Allah's a liar because Muhammad wouldn't sin, or Allah's an ignoramus, he doesn't know the future. You, get, you understand the dilemma here? If Muhammad stops sinning from that moment on, then that means Allah is an ignoramus because he doesn't know the future. Because what sins of the future he's going to forgive when Muhammad commits none? Or Allah's a liar saying, I'm going to forgive you your future sins because he ain't going to forgive anything. Which means Muhammad had no choice but to sin in order not to falsify the words of Allah. <laughs> Prophet Google, she done it. You caught it? Oh, it's going to get worse, though. Let me show you some of Muhammad's sins. Chapter 80, verses 1 to 12. Let's see if you guys can figure it out. We're going to probably have to do a part, part two. Chapter 80, verses 1 to 2. I mean, chapter 80, verses 1 to 12. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue and strengthen my voice and make my voice pleasing to the sound of your servants, to the ears of your servants, to the ears of your servants. By the power of the Holy Spirit, save me from stammering and confusion. In Jesus' name. Okay. Chapter 80, verses 1 to 12. Okay. Tell me if you figure out why Allah is rebuking Muhammad. He frowned and turned his back. Ah. Because there came to him the blind man. And what would make you know that he would purify himself or become reminded so that the reminder should profit him? As for him who considers himself free from need of you, to him do you address yourself. As for him who considers himself free of you, doesn't need you, doesn't care about you, you occupied yourself with him. Right? And no blame is on you if he would not purify himself. So if he didn't purify himself, it's not your blame. He'd be condemned. But you focus your attention on this guy who doesn't have anything to do with you. And as to him who comes to you striving hard and he fears from him, you diverted yourself. You ignored him. Nay, surely it is an admonishment. So let him who pleases minded. Do you understand this rebuke? You guys understood this rebuke? Do you guys understand why Allah is rebuking Muhammad and disgracing him in his book? Everyone figure it out or no? Let's you figure it out. I know the language was kind of hard. The passage is rebuking Muhammad because a poor blind man came asking Muhammad for counsel. But he asked him when Muhammad was busy trying to appease a very influential Pagan noble of the Quraysh, a pagan who looked down at Muhammad, who didn't think Muhammad was a true prophet and thought he was a joke. So Muhammad was busy trying to appease this pagan and get him to become Muslim because he's influential. When the blind man came, Muhammad said, oh, shit, and ignored him. What a marked difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Can you show me a single place? Where Jesus frowned on a blind man or a per person or a marginalized purpose person in order to appease and influence a nobleman who didn't care about Jesus or his mission? Okay, I was buffering. And this is in the Quran, and this is supposedly the perfect man. The perfect man, guys. The perfect man. Right? Oh, but it gets worse. We're going to spend some time unpacking how the Quran and the traditions threaten Muhammad because of his sins and failure, which is ironic because Allah said he'd forgive him, right? Yeah, let's see. This is chapter 94, verses 2 to 3. 
chapter 94, verses 2 to 3. And we raised from you your sin, load, burden. So we removed your burden of sin, which weighed heavily on your burden back, which burdened your back. The sin that was crushing you, we removed that burden from you. Chapter 94, verses 2 to 3. Okay? Chapter 93, verse 7. I like this one. Pay attention to chapter 93, verse 7. Did he not find you astray and guide you? Now let me read other translations. That was Ali Kuli Quray. Did he not find you astray and guide you? Now here's Muhammad Ahmed Samira translation. And he found you misguided, so he guided you. And another translation, Bijan Moinian. Bijan Moinian. And for the longest time, longest years, you were lost in darkness and lived like a pagan and revealed to you the truth about the meaning of the life, why you were you are here, etc. Did you catch it? 94 verse 7 says, Muhammad was misguided, lost in darkness, and guided him. You know why that's interesting? Because that's what Muslims pray in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatiha, when they say, guide us on the straight path, Surah Al-Mustaqeen, and not on the path of those who are misguided. al dalin Here, the Quran says, Muhammad was like those lost, misguided, al dalin who needed to be guided. Meaning he was a lost, sinful pagan who needed to be guided. In contrast to Jesus, who from conception was pure and righteous and made a prophet of God from conception, whose mother was pure, conceived in purity, and the greatest woman. Are you seeing the difference? Focus, guys. Seeing the difference? Now let me read Muhammad Assad's. And by the way, that was chapter 93, verse 7. 93, verse 7, Lord Jesus, save me from error. The other verse where it says, we remove your burden, your load of sin, was chapter 94, verses 2 to 3. Now here, let's read what Muhammad Assad says. Okay. In his exposition of chapter 94, verses 2 to 3. The burden of the past sins, of thy past sins, which are now forgiven. Tabari on the authority of Mujahid, Katada, Adahak, and Ibn Zayyid. In the case of Muhammad, this relates apparently to mistakes committed before his call to prophethood. Ibn Abidam. And it's obviously an echo of 93 verse 7. Has he not found thee lost on thy way and guided thee? Now it's going to get even worse for Muslims, guys. It's going to get even worse for Muslims. If you're not tired, not bored with this topic, but learning how to destroy Islam and use Islam to glorify Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge, judge, it's going to get worse for Muslims. You ready? Focus, guys. Everyone ready? Watch this, guys. Talk about a wicked, immoral, confused prophet whose God is threatening left and right. It seems like either Muhammad is a schizophrenic or is God because his God says, I'm going to forgive you your future sins. But then the same Quran, his God threatens to kill him dead and damn him to hell. Here, chapter 17, verses 73 to 75. Chapter 17, verses 73 to 75. You ready? Okay. Here you go. And surely they had purpose to turn you away from that which we have revealed to you. The pagans were about to cause you to turn away from the revelation. That you should forge, make up against us other than that. And then they would have certainly have taken you for a friend. You would have recited things to appease them. And then they would have been your friends. Now watch this. Had it not been that we had already established you, you would have certainly been near to incline to them a little. You would have fallen for their suggestions. In that case, we would certainly have made you test, taste a double punishment in this life and a double punishment after death Then you would not have found any helper against us. Wow, what a threat.
Can you imagine the Father of the Lord Jesus speaking to Jesus this way? Can you imagine the Holy Spirit speaking to Jesus this way? You would have been inclined to agree with their demands and appease them, and they would have befriended you. Then we would have given you a double punishment in this world and a double punishment in hell. And this is the perfect example, the model of moral excellence, the leader of all the messengers, the beloved of Allah. Really? Now, chapter 33, verse 1. Chapter 33, verse 1. Follow with me, guys. O prophet, be careful of your duty to Allah and do not comply with the wishes of unbelievers and the hypocrites. Surely Allah is knowing wise. Can you imagine the father of our Lord Jesus saying to Jesus, Be careful, son. Do not comply with the wishes of the unbelievers. Can you imagine that? Father speaking to the son that way. Chapter 39, verse 65. Chapter 39, verse 65. Watch here, guys. And certainly it has been revealed to you, revealed to you, Muhammad. Pay attention. Muhammad, it's revealed to you and to those before you. Surely, if you associate, Muhammad included, with Allah, your work would certainly come to naught and you would certainly be of the losers. Can you imagine the Father saying to the Lord Jesus, Son, I'm revealing to you and them. If any of you worship someone other than me, you and them will be all of the losers. Can you guys imagine that? I'm giving you a moment to digest this. Okay. This one is even worse. Chapter 72, 20 to 25. Say, chapter 72, 20, 25. Surely no one can protect me. This is Muhammad speaking. Muhammad, tell them this. Allah is telling Muhammad to say this. Surely no one can protect me against Allah, <clears throat> nor can I find besides him any place of refuge. It is only a delivering of communications from Allah and his message. And whoever displays Allah and his apostle, surely he shall have the fire of hell to abide therein for a long time. Until then, they see what they are threatened with. Then shall they know who is weaker in helpers and fewer in numbers. Say, Muhammad, say this. I do not know whether that with which you are threatened, be nigh as it near, or whether my Lord will appoint it for a term, meaning whether you're going to be punished now or maybe in the future. Now, can you imagine Jesus being commanded by the Father to say, Son, say, I do not have any protector against my Father or helper against my Father. To help me if my father wants to punish me. Can you imagine Jesus speaking that way? So Allah tells Muhammad to tell them, look, I have no protector or helper against Allah if Allah wants to do something to me. Now, first last, can you post chapter 10, verse 15 of the Quran? Chapter 10, verse 15 of the Quran for us? Because I got more. Problems for Muslims. Chapter 10, verse 15. And when our clear revelations are recited to them, they who look not for the meeting with us say, bring a lecture other than this or change it. Say, notice, look, Allah's telling him again. Say, O Muhammad, it is not for me to change it of my accord. I only follow that which is inspired in me. Lo, if I disobey my Lord, I fear the retri retribution of an awful day. Can you imagine the father telling Jesus, Son, say, I don't change revelation according to my will. Because I fear that dreadful day, the day of judgment. <laughs> wow, Muhammad. And this is your God who told you, hey, don't worry about it. Your past sins and future sins are forgiven. Now, this one is the nightmare for the Muslims. This one is the nightmare for the Muslims. Are you ready? Chapter 69, verses 44 to 47 of the Quran. David Un has a video on this. David and I have done sessions on this, and we even did a session with Christian Prince on this. 
Chapter 69, verses 44 to 47. Watch this. This one, this is what do you make? Mac and beauties. 69, 44, 47. And if I had fabricated against us, and if he, I'm sorry, if he, Muhammad, if he forged something against us, some of the sayings, sayings that did not come from us, but he made it up, we would certainly have seized him by the right hand, then we would certainly have cut off his aorta, and none of you could have withheld us from him. Wow. What a scary threat. Allah says, if he made up a saying and attributed to us, we would seize him violently by the right hand, cut off his air aorta, and none of you could stop us and help him against us. Can you imagine the father of our Lord Jesus Christ saying to, to Jesus, Jesus, tell them, if you make up a saying in my name, I would seize you violently by your right hand and cut off your aorta. Wow. And guess What's the problem, guys? You guys already know this. Guess what the problem is? According to Islamic traditions, a Jewish woman poisoned the shoulder of lamb that Muhammad ate. And he realized his poison. He spit it out, but not in time enough for the poison not to start spread throughout his system and slowly and surely over the years cause him agony and pain so that he himself says in the sound narrations, I still feel the effects of the poison so that I feel as if my life vein is being cut off, O oh Aisha. I feel my life vein being cut off from the effects of the poison. And he died from that poison, and he died a painful, humiliating death where he uttered the words, I feel like my life vein, my aorta is being cut off. But that's exactly the kind of death the Quran said he would die if Allah hated him and was disgusted with him and displeased with him. Wow. Now go to Acts 17 Apologetics, type in who killed Muhammad. He did a session on this. And he did one with me, and then we did one with Christian Prince. Full documentation there. Now, let me read this one. Guys, what would you say if the Lord Jesus Christ came up to his followers and said the following? What would, the Lord, what would you say if the Lord Jesus came to his followers and said, Even though I'm the Son of God, I do not know what my Father will do with you or me. Would that trouble you? Would that disturb you? Would that cause you sleepless nights? If Jesus, the Son of God, says, Though I'm the Son of God, I don't know what the Father will do with you or with me. I'm just His Son sent to relay the message. Would you be troubled by that saying? Well, guess what Muhammad says in the Quran? Chapter 46, verses 8 to 9 in the Quran. Chapter 46, verses 8 to 9 in the Quran. Nay! They say he has forged it. Say, if I have forged it, you do not control anything from me from Allah. You can't do anything to stop Allah from punishing me. He knows best what you utter concerning it. He is enough as a witness between me and you. And he is the forgiving, merciful. Say, this verse 9, guys, pay attention. I am not the first of the apostles, and I do not know what will be done with me or with you. Say, Allah is telling Muhammad, say, I am not the first of the apostles, and I do not know what will be done with me or with you, and I do not follow anything but that which is revealed to me, and I'm nothing but a plain war warner. Golly gee, gosh, goodness. 46.9. Say, and do not know, and I do not know what will be done with me or with you, and I do not follow anything but that which is revealed to me, and I'm nothing but a plain warner. Say, I'm not the first of the apostles. I do not know what will be done with me or with you. So I'm repeating it because I want it to sink in. Now let me read the hadith, the sound narrations. Sahil Bukhari, Sahil Bukhari, 
Volume 4, number 16. Said Buk All this is in my article. Said Bukhari, article I linked to. Evidence of Muhammad was a sinful transgressor. Said Bukhari, volume 4, number 16. Narrate Abu Huraira. When Allah revealed the verse, warn your nearest kinsmen. Allah's apostle got up and said, O oh, people of Quraysh, or said similar words, buy yourselves from the hellfire. Save yourselves from the hellfire. As I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. O oh, Bani Abdumanif, Abdumanif, I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. O oh, Safiya, the aunt of Allah's apostle, my aunt, I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. Now notice what he says to his daughter. Now Muhammad's going to speak to his daughter. O oh, Fatima bint Muhammad, O oh, Fatima, my daughter, ask me anything from my wealth, but I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. What? Even your own daughter? What? O oh, Fatima bint Muhammad, ask me anything from my wealth, but I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. Can you imagine Jesus going around saying, Oh, Peter, save yourself, because I cannot save you from the Father's punishment. Oh, oh, Thomas, Bartholomew, John, save yourselves, because I cannot save you from the Father's punishment. Oh, my beloved mother. My blessed mother, Mary, my beloved mother, save yourself because I cannot save you from the Father's punishment. And you have stupid so called Christians leaving the glorious, beautiful Jesus Christ of the New Testament, who's the real Jesus of history, and the glorious gospel of God. For this wicked, immoral, schizophrenic, narcissistic, demonized false prophet. Let me read another hadith. Here's another hadith. Sal Bukhari, volume 5, number 266. Sal Bukhari, volume 5, number 266. Okay. Narid Um Al Ala, an Ansari woman, woman from Medina, who gave the Pledge of Allegiance to the Prophet, that the Ansar drew lots concerning the dwell dwelling of the immigrants. Uthman ibn Mazun, this is a man who's going to die as a follower of Muhammad. Uthman ibn Mazun was, de was decided to dwell with them, i.e., Um Al Ala's family, a believer, a follower of Muhammad. Who died? Uthman fell ill, and I nursed him till he died. And we covered him with his clothes. Then the Prophet came to us, and I, addressing the dead body, said, O oh, Abu Asayyib, may Allah's mercy be upon you. Now notice what she says. I bear witness that Allah's honored you. I testify Allah's honored you. On that, the Prophet said, Now notice what Muhammad says to her. On that, the Prophet said, How do you know that Allah's honored him? How do you know that Allah has honored him? I replied, I do not know. May my father and mother be sacrificed for you, Allah's apostle. But who else is worthy of it? If not Uthman. If anyone's worthy, it's him. Now notice what Muhammad says. He said, as to him, by Allah, death has overtaken him. And I hope the best for him. By Allah, though I am the apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. I don't even know what he's going to do to me when I die. So how dare you say Allah's honored him? By Allah, I will never assert, now this is her, the piety of anyone after him. That made me sad. And when I slept, I saw a dream in a, a flowing stream for Uthman ibn Mazun. And I went to Allah's apostle and told him of it. He remarked, that symbolizes his good deeds. Are you guys blown away by what you just read? Are you blown away by what you just read? This woman said, I bear witness, Allah has honored you. To a pious man who is a devout Muslim who died, a devout Muslim. Muhammad gets angry and says, how do you know Allah has honored him? Look, as far as he's concerned, he's dead. 
But I don't know what Allah will do with him. You know why? Because I don't know what Allah will do with me when I die. And yet you have so-called Christians leaving the assurance that the, the Lord Jesus gives us to follow this fake, immoral, sensualist imposter who could even guarantee that someone who followed him when he died was honored by Allah. Are you guys shocked at this before I move on? How many of you shocked by this? So let me give you another article that goes with this. Lord willing, I'll put these articles in the description box and pin it as a comment. All right? Because I'm going to show you something else. Let me get this article for you. Okay, let me get this article for you. This article is titled, None Can Feel Safe From Allah's Schemes. None can feel safe from Allah's schemes. Okay? None can feel safe from Allah's schemes. Click on that link. When Abu Bakr was about to die, this is what he says. Okay? Watch here. This comes from Khalid, Muhammad Khalid, successors of the messenger. Translated by Muhammad Mahdi al Sharif or Sharif. Dar al Qutub al Ilmiya, Beirut, Lebanon, 2005, Book 1, Abu Bakr has come, page 99. Khalid Muhammad Khalid, successors of the messenger, translated by Muhammad Mahdi al Sharif, page 99. Abu Bakr starts weeping. He starts crying because he's about to die. Although he had such a faith, which was too great to suffice all the inhabitants of the earth, he was afraid that his heart might go astray. So he used to utter while weeping, would that I have been a bitter tree. In other words, I'd rather have been a tree than a human being. Whenever he was reminded of his position on the site, he would say, Wallahi, Wallah, by Allah, I would not rest assured and feel safe from the deception of Allah La amanu la makir Allah, the word makir, from the deception of Allah, even if I had one foot in paradise, my goodness. This is Muhammad's best friend, the first caliph, caliph, his father in law, Muhammad's father in law, because Aisha's daughter was the young girl, the nine year old that Muhammad married and slept with when he was 54. Muhammad's best friend, the first caliph, look what he says. Here it is, quote, by Allah, I would not rest assured and feel safe from the deception of Allah, la amanu lamakr Allah, even if I had one foot in paradise. What kind of religion is this, dude? That he's saying, even if I had one foot on Allah, I still wouldn't feel safe from Allah's lying and schemes and deception because he may have deceived me saying, paradise is mine, and as I'm about to enter, he'll throw me into hell. Now let's contrast this with the beloved apostle and servant of the true God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do me a favor, brother. Post 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. We're almost done. Now notice Paul, the last letter he wrote by inspiration. Notice his confidence, folks. Notice his confidence. Contrast the difference. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now notice verse 8. A true servant of the true God, the Lord Jesus. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What a marked difference between a true servant of the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this immoral imposter who serves and proclaims a false God named Allah. 2 Timothy 4, 16, 18. 2 Timothy 4, 16, 18. Second Timothy 4, 16, 18. 
At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Now notice what he says, 17, 18. But the Lord, meaning Jesus, stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a marked difference between the attitude of a true servant of the true God, the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart, and this imposter, sensualist, antichrist, servant of a false God, whose name was Muhammad. You see the difference? One more example. Acts 7, 55 to 56. The first Christian martyr, Stephen. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Watch his attitude. Acts 7, 55 to 56. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Notice, a true servant who died as a true martyr, Shaheed, for the true God, who isn't Allah Muhammad, and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now notice why the Lord Jesus opened up the veil of heaven, filling Stephen with the Holy Spirit to see Jesus in heaven, standing in his glorified physical body at the right hand of God the Father. Why did he do it? Let me show you why. Let's read now Acts 7, 57 to 58. Pay attention, guys, because this should bless you. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Guys, do you see why the Lord Jesus opened heaven and allowed him to see heaven with his physical eyes and see the Lord Jesus standing in his glorified physical body, filling with the Holy Spirit to see that? Because they're about to kill him, stone him. So Jesus, in his love and compassion, appeared to him in order to make the stoning of no effect. Because once you see Jesus, no matter what they do, it means nothing. Go ahead. Throw those stones. Bash my head. Because I'm about to enter glory and bow before his feet and kiss his feet. You see the difference? So now notice Stephen's departing words. Acts 7, 59 to 60. Acts 7, 59 to 60. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He prayed to Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm about to enter your presence. Take my spirit so I can be with you and enter your rest. Now notice 60. Then he knelt down as he's about to die and the spirit leaves his body and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You caught it? You see the difference between a Muhammad and an Abu Bakr and a Paul and a Stephen? Do you see the difference? Our Jesus is alive, and we will live when our bodies die. And when he returns with our spirits, he will recreate our bodies, unite them with our spirits, where we'll dwell with him on earth in glorified physical bodies, deathless, morally incorruptible. In a new earth, this earth transformed, where there'll be no more evil, sin, death, disease, or Satan. That will happen because Jesus is alive. He truly lives. He's alive. It will happen. May it happen sooner than later. Now, before I wrap things up, because we'll do a part two if you want me to, a part two because I got more points to cover. You've heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again. Because I mentioned Stephen on many occasions in my sessions, talking about salvation, the Trinity, the deed of Christ. He often comes up. The Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, Mark 16, 19. 
Yep, watch here. I'm going to get to that seagull. That's the point I made in previous sessions. I'm going to repeat it again. The power of intercession. How God will save people out of his love for you and because of your prayer. To encourage you to pray. Mark 16, 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus is seated, but here in the vision, he's standing. Do you know why? The King of kings and the Lord of lords stands up in honor of his servant. Stands up to honor his servant saying, Stephen, come home, son. Come home. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have honored me and you've brought me great glory. And you've made me proud, son. Come home to these arms so I can embrace you and love on you. Come home, Stephen. <clears throat> Come home. Come home. Come home to your master. <clears throat> right? Now let me show you. He's beautiful, isn't he? <clears throat> He's beautiful, right? Jesus Christ, the Father's eternal Son, the great God and Savior, gets off his throne. He stands off his throne, my Lord, my beautiful Savior. Stephen, well done, good and faithful slave. You have made me proud. You've honored me. So now I honor you. Come home. Come home to your father who loves you. And come home to your savior who adores you. Come home, Stephen. Wow. Now can you not be in love with Jesus? How can you not be in love with Jesus, right? How can you not love him? How can you not love him? Brethren, no matter what you go through, abandonment, parents abandoning you, children abandoning you, spouses abandoning you, at the end of the day, all of this will mean nothing when you see Jesus and behold his glory. You're going to say, Lord, it was all worth it. You were worth it. It was all worth it. Lord, what I experienced on earth means nothing. And what I'm experiencing now, seeing that I made you happy, and I made you smile, and I made you proud of me, Lord. I made you proud of me. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Right? Wow. Now, let me show you the power of your prayers. Let me show you how much the Lord Jesus loves you, adores you, and honors you, and cherish your prayers. That when you pray, you delight, delight his heart. And in, out of love for you, and in honor for you, and, and honor for you, out of love for you, and in honor of you, he acts and moves <clears throat> In accord with your prayers. Can I show you that? Are you ready? Can I show you? Are you ready to show how much Jesus loves his church and adores his church? And because he loves his church, he cherishes the prayers of his church and he honors the prayers of his church. Your prayers are powerful to him because he loves you. And he loves when you pray to him. And he does things to show you. I love you. I honor you. Your prayer is my delight. Let me prove it to you. Let's read Acts 7, 60 one more time. Someone mention it. Acts 7, 60 one more time. Now, what I want you to do is read Acts 6 and 7 about Stephen. He was a man filled with the Holy Spirit, a holy slave, who had absolute astonishing knowledge of the Old Testament. Well versed in the Old Testament and an explanation. Because you're going to see why this is relevant. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So he's asking Jesus, these people who are murdering me or proving of my murder, 
Lord, don't condemn them. Have mercy on them. Well, if the Lord does not condemn them for the sin, that means he'll forgive them and save them, right? Acts 8, verse 1. The very next verse. Acts 8, verse 1. Acts 8, verse 1. Get, guys, get ready. Now Saul was consenting to his death. There you go. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. You know why Luke mentioned Saul? Because Luke is showing you on the basis of Stephen's prayer, Jesus honored his prayer by converting Saul. You know what, Stephen? Because of your prayer, that man Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Snoon of Gamaliel, who's also mighty in the Old Testament like you, I will now save him to replace you. And do what you are doing for my glory. I honor you, Stephen. I'm going to make Saul, Paul, the lion of the faith, who gave us half the New Testament. Catch it? Do you see how powerful our prayers are? If we're walking in union with the Spirit, yielding to the Spirit, resisting the flesh, doing what we're supposed to, praying more, fasting more, Doing his will, loving by our actions and deeds, preaching the gospel without shame, without compromise, then our prayers will do wonders. See it? Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty, the eternal companion of the Spirit, the eternal heart of the Father became flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit, the only true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the Bible, who's living and real, who is the life. And our Lord Jesus will return. Modern Atha, come sooner than later. Lord Jesus, cover us, our loved ones, my daughters, in your blood. Seal us, our loved ones and my daughters, in your love, by your spirit. And increase in us, Lord Jesus. And never allow us to shame you, dishonor you, blaspheme your name, but to die glorifying you. Keep us in love with you. Keep us holy. Give us the health we need to serve you and provide for us. We love you, Son of God. We love you, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Joseph, the God of Jabez, the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the God of the apostles, the God of Paul, the God of Stephen, the God of the early church fathers. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. Make us like them. And count us worthy to be part of their company by your grace, by your mercy, by the blood of the cross. We thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.